introduction. Um, we are designers, and actually we love to be designers, because we believe designers are lucky enough to live in the future. Really, we, when we are commissioned by our clients, we conceive our designs, and we do them to be in the market at least one year after the day of the beginning of the project, or sometimes even later, when we have to work on the concepts for the future. So actually it is very fun if you think that we are always living in the future, but it is also our responsibility to envision the future for the others. And actually living in the future and thinking about the future is difficult uh, because the future has become dangerous. Everything was much easier when I was a child in the 60s because it was clear what progress should have been. Everybody was thinking progress will be going on the moon, uh, building skyscrapers, uh, inventing new languages, new visual languages every day. So it was clear that we were building something, that things would have grown, that we would uh, have uh, built something different every day. Then something happened. Then we discovered, fortunately, that we, in building something, we were also destroying. We were destroying our planet, uh, so we slowed down, we thought, and we think, uh, well, is really the future about growth? Should we slow down? That's in part uh, reasonable, it's absolutely legitimate. We are thinking about sustainability, we are thinking about growing only if we need to. But on the other side, I think that this uh, maybe has depressed us a little bit, especially when we think about generating new languages or dreaming about the future. I think that there is an alternative, an alternative uh, that is neither building and growing uh, and going on the moon, uh, but it's also not uh, grounding back on Earth. Uh, I mean, in English, uh, down to Earth means literally we came back to our planet, but down to Earth means also being more modest uh, and maybe being a little too static. Well, for uh, that reason, actually, we have another idea of the future. Um, our future is slightly different than the one where the artificial was destroying the nature. In our idea of the future, the artificial accelerates the evolution of um, nature. Um, with, uh, actually, we would like to show you uh, two examples of our projects where we would like to explain more about our idea of future. One of them is the future of food. Um, this is the accumulation of uh, some of our projects done for real clients under the same topic. We have done um, several different projects for uh, food industries. Some of them are strategic um, projects for the, uh, one of the biggest uh, pasta manufacturer in Italy, and uh, the other projects are from cutlery designs to packaging designs for food, or packaging designs for small appliances, kitchen appliances, or like the entire design of the hotelier collections, and so So all these projects that we have um, done in past uh, let, in, in a way, um, help us to think for um, a project that will be used for the next, next generation of the products. So, uh, we, uh, we will begin with one of them, which is the future of food.
So this is our future of food now. That was just a provocation. That's why we just did show you. I'm sure you all have recognized the 2001 Space Odyssey movie from the Stanley Kubrick. And that was the imagination of more than 10 years ago, uh, imagined more than 40 years ago in 1968. Uh, there was a different and fantastic language um, where the, of course, you have noticed that there is no sign of natural. There is a, dominant, a dominance of the artificial. It is so artificial that actually there is not even more gravity. So the gravity is completely taken off. And with that, unfortunately, also was taken off the, the, the rituality of having the food as well. You might have noticed, we didn't see actually the, in details the, the, the food itself, but how it was served, it was served in a tray, possibly the, um, the, the pills uh, that were containing the food, food and pills, that were supposed to be our today's normal meals. And luckily, this didn't happen. And in a way, actually, unfortunately, we are not flying to the moon, but we are lucky enough to not to eat the pills for today. So something has happened. We don't eat pills because uh, there is a, has been a growing movement. Uh, one movement actually has a name. It's called slow food. It's not the only one. Uh, we, what we recognized with these movements uh, is that we didn't want to the progress uh, to kill our connection with food. We didn't want progress, uh, that idea of progress, to kill our experience of food. Uh, the slow movement uh, is one of our inspiration because uh, it has uh, returned to thinking about traditional food, about high quality food. So that's very interesting. It is inspiring. On the other side, is it really true that there is no innovation in food, that we should uh, continue to eat the same foods, uh, that we should uh, continue to eat in an environment and with a visual language that is exactly the same one of our grandmothers? Or are we really sure that the new technology would really ruin the traditional way of eating the food or even the aspect of the food? Well, something more has happened, slightly more recently, and definitely much more inspirational for us. Um, some, a generation of chefs, uh, this is the most known of them, this is called, uh, he called, he's called Ferran Adria. He, is, uh, he has been nominated the best chef in the world. And you see what he manipulates. This is not junk food, this is the farthest away from being junk food. It's the best food uh, on earth uh, judged by, by other chefs. Uh, and it's natural, but it doesn't look like. Ferran Adria and other chefs uh, use uh, new technologies to create a food that is even better than the one of our grandmothers. And he invents, and that's the biggest inspiration for us, he invents a visual language with it. We never saw foams on our table. We never saw strange cold fog to prepare food. Uh, so this combination uh, of uh, uh, naturality and artificiality, both in actual functions uh, and uh, in uh, visual language, uh, is the biggest inspiration for us today in imagining what, what could be the future of food, but also what could be the right language for design today. So this is the future of, the future of food. This is really for us the future of food, which is um, actually, it is an actual dining experience um, in, uh, in one of the 
best restaurants uh, in the world, Alinea, with uh, uh, its chef is uh, Chef Ashatz, who is coming from the same generation, same culture of the Ferran Adria that Marco was mentioning before. And this is completely a new experience where we see the real high technology is in our table. It's not even in the kitchen. It is on our table where do they cook the dessert over there. And if you have noticed, actually, the, the cooking is realized with extreme cold. So with the liquido neutrogena is the, uh, the, 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 the liquid chocolate was poured at the beginning in the uh, glasses and then after the extreme cold explosion, <laughs> it became uh, solid. So we believe that the high technology or the new technologies actually do good for not only the, the, the mm, taste of the food, but also for the quality of the food. Then we met Dr. Guo, which is an unknown, it's not a celebrity, he is not a chef. And uh, so what's the connection between a doctor and uh, the inspiration we had uh, from uh, the best chefs in the world? Well, Dr. Guo is uh, uh, actually trained, uh, he's Chinese, and he's trained as uh, a herbal, in herbal, traditional herbal medicine in China. Then he moved to the US and he also studied and specialized in Western conventional scientific medicine. And he decided to go back to herbal medicine. So he has not much to do with food, even if actually the herbal medicine should be very much integrated with how we eat and how we drink. Uh, but uh, the inspiration that comes from him uh, is that he is also, he has also been able to combine natural and in this case science. He has been able to combine uh, the long, long tradition of Chinese herbal medicine, which is indeed very effective, uh, with the science uh, and the studies of uh, diseases uh, today. The only problem we have uh, with Dr. Guo is not uh, a, a health problem, uh, is the fact uh, that uh, the pills he gives us uh, are actually normal pills uh, in plastic, uh, and they don't have anything of natural. They have a little bit of smell. But so what we find uh, not so inspiring in this case uh, is that uh, in order to be accepted, he had uh, to use a visual language that is the one of science and artificiality. He didn't do the step, well, it's not his job because he's a doctor, but he didn't do the step in inventing the right uh, visual aesthetics uh, that expresses what he represents. It's like a Ferran Adria selling his food in a Campbell soup can. It's a little bit of a missed, missed opportunity. So this is our design. This is our envision for the future of the ki small kitchen appliances, where we would like to, we wanted to combine the high technology with the high quality. And actually we did design the appliances, but you will see not only the machines. But we started with uh, the visual language, which is the, our first responsibility. And what we show here, and I will tell you more in detail later, is uh, a combination of uh, a, a soft, uh, quiet, calm, domestic, familiar language. This is the one that you see on the right. Uh, this is a case of, of a teapot and, and, and a system to make the best tea ever. So we combine traditional material and traditional shapes, uh, what you see on the right. Uh, and on the left, you see another piece uh, or another component uh, of this preparation that is actually accepting uh, new technologies. Uh, we were thinking to have uh, the best system to get exactly at the right temperature, which is different for different types of teas and different, for different types of traditions of preparing tea. So that's an example of uh, our Try, attempt to combine uh, a language that has some familiarity but accept uh, a, a, an innovation and, and an idea of progress. This is the project that where we, are, we were inspired by the Space Odyssey, where we inspired were, uh, from the um, 
slow food, the uh, um, molecular cuisine, and Dr. Guo. Uh, as you will see, we, we have designed the entire experience of the food, not only the, um, the, the, uh, the tools. We have designed the, um, uh, the experience ecosystem of, uh, of, uh, of the food and the tools itself. So each one uh, of uh, the parts of the system uh, has uh, an appliance and an, a little bit of an invention and a design of the food. We, as a provocation, we think that maybe there is a little bit of uh, the food in pills that we were supposed to eat, to, to, to eat uh, in year 2000, but there is something more. There is a very different way of looking at the pills that you add to your food. In, the, in this example, what we were imagining is uh, that the pill would contain uh, natural things, like uh, the tea leaves in the case of tea, enhanced by maybe spices that come uh, from the best chefs, uh, in a package that is not as arid and as uh, pseudo-scientific uh, as Dr. Guo's pills. Uh, we were imagining to have a hydrosoluble capsule, which is basically something that melts into water, technologies that are used in medicines uh, because they melt in your belly. And the strange uh, dot that you see up there is what we imagine could be the additional nutrients uh, that come, for example, from, exam for example, from uh, uh, herbal medicines. So these pills contain the best of nature, the best of science, uh, and it looks like neither. It looks like something new and, uh, and, and, and special, an exploration of new languages. One by one, uh, we already anticipated uh, 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 this uh, system, uh, these uh, components to prepare the best tea. So we have uh, for each one of the uh, experiences that we designed for, we have uh, an appliance, the tea maker that you see there. We have uh, designed the food, uh, the pills uh, that we mentioned before, and we imagined a ritual around the preparation of tea. In this case, actually quite similar to one of the ways you have uh, in Turkey to prepare tea that to me is still very complicated because you put the teapot above, uh, on top of, uh, <laughs> of the steamer and so on. So we keep some of the manuality and ritual that is uh, very important, we believe. Another example, uh, if we want to prepare the best uh, juice, uh, whether it's fruit or vegetables, uh, uh, we imagine here to use the best technologies to help uh, e extract uh, vitamins from fruit, uh, and it seems like the best technology today is microfiltering and centrifugate and so on. So we do uh, use uh, technologies in this way. We don't do anything to the fruit itself. Uh, we would actually buy it uh, from your local store. What we add uh, is uh, the kind of uh, pills up there that could be the super nutrients, uh, the additional natural uh, elements that you add to your juice that could be proteins or antioxidants uh, and so on. Always this combination of uh, natural and natural uh, helped by technology. Third example uh, that we imagine for people that are really paranoid and maniac about having the freshest, freshest uh, ingredients, uh, you would buy grains uh, locally, you would mill them, you, may, you would prepare your flour or your cereals uh, at home with a kind of micro grinder and uh, the additional uh, food elements that we were imagining here are additional fibers or exactly the right composition of fibers and here the the invention is that uh, also in this case we imagine what what's the shape uh, of uh, natural artificial fibers uh, and we created this kind of micro bonsai fibers uh, that has a very organic look uh, but don't exist in nature. Since you have noticed actually that we, do not, we did not design only the tools but also the food and also the health. So we actually would like the people to drink more water, fresh water. Um, so we did have the, we did design the, uh, practically the refrigerator on your table or on your bedside table. 
uh, where these uh, filtered uh, strings are cooling your water and uh, we are adding these filters which will actually purify your water and also give the uh, enough vitamins needed and also a little bit of flavor a little bit of flavor because we do not like the sodas we do not like the sugar that should be consumed while we are drinking water as it is happening right now and uh, finally the, uh, the the soup maker the pot that where we will have the best soup ever because it is um, the soup where we will be prepare the food and also this is continuously will um, cook the food and keep it warm with the fresh vegetables that we are going to buy from our local market and we will add our flavored cubes which are not the typical bouillons but they are just the the, the um, perfect cubes where we keep the recipes of the masters of the, perf the best chefs of the world so they give their recipes into that cube and what we do is combining the fresh vegetable and this um, recipe and just we add the water and we have on our table Ferran Adria's fantastic soup so this is our project where we did not only design the tools, we did also design the food. It is a um, way of preparing, it's way of distributing and it's way of consuming. We have more, we have another example uh, on a very different context, um, uh, but we grew these concepts in the same way we did the ones on the future of food. This is about the future of work uh, and the thoughts uh, came uh, from uh, various projects that we did uh, for office furniture. Uh, we did the projects about interacting with digital tools uh, like computers, phones, uh, tablets and so on. Uh, so we, after having done these specific projects on the next generation, uh, we did think, okay, what will happen to the next next generation? What will be the future of work? And that's what we think the future of work could be. It's a fantastic movie. Well, but this is not our future of work. Um, of course, that was, an, again, a provocation from uh, almost the same time of uh, Space Odyssey movie. Uh, this is from Jacques Tati, 
1967, one year earlier than the Space Odyssey. Um, what Jacques Tati has done here, actually, he anticipated the future spaces of the offices. It is actually today exactly like that. The, uh, the, the, the big offices, there is a huge space, an open space, and then there are the cubicles. What, um, while he was directing this movie, he asked the people to walk even on 90 degrees between the ales. So that was his way of seeing the future. And um, what maybe he didn't see were, were the computers. But if you do add today's computers to that scenario, actually that wouldn't change too much because the people are in those cubicles are all alone. If you add the computers, they will be all alone. Why? What? What? With what? With the computers? Actually, the inspiration here comes uh, from uh, what the computer has become. Computers are not anymore called computers very often. They are not uh, desktop computers. Uh, the, the percentage of type of computer that is reduced the most is desktop. We have laptops, we have tablets, uh, we have large screens. Uh, so the biggest, more positive news uh, today is that technology is not uh, restricting the way we think about the space of the office. We are self-inflicting to ourselves the rational greed of our cubicles. We don't need them. In a sense, we don't even need desks. The real flexibility that uh, computing today offers is that you can work on any size of device uh, with very natural interactions. You don't need desks. And you can uh, use this flexibility to imagine uh, a space uh, that is very different. Then the other thing that is happening is that there are generations that are already thinking in these terms, thinking that uh, what they do when they access digital information is not interacting between one man and a machine, but they are choreographing multi multiple screens. This is a, an actual screenshot uh, from a research we did on the future of TV. This is the room of uh, an average uh, uh, 25 years old uh, in, uh, in Boston. And she has uh, uh, here visible three screens, uh, one in her hands, uh, one uh, in, uh, in front of her and one more distant. If we were doing this, uh, pic taking these pictures today, she would have four because she would have a tablet. So. And the way she structured the space of her room uh, is around uh, not the rigidity that these uh, interaction impose, uh, but around the flexibility that these uh, allow. She's eating and chatting and Facebooking with friends. Uh, and while she Facebooks, uh, she selects TV according to what her friends uh, suggest her. So what this means is that uh, the work on uh, future technologies in the office is not about uh, designing the interaction between a person and a thing, uh, but uh, using uh, the va various interactions uh, to structure the space between people and people and people and screens. So our idea, our project, uh, the piece of the project that we built for the future of work uh, is to think uh, that uh, these uh, screens uh, are even less rigid than what they are today. Imagine that uh, large screens don't even need a wall to be hanged on. They are self-standing and you can put them in any position. You can put them uh, horizontal, you can put vertical like a board, you can write on them, you can put them like a table and interact with them. And even small screens that sometimes they are in our hands, they could have a role in the space, defining the space. In this specific case, we didn't design the screens, we just took uh, existing screens. So these are things that are possible. In this case, it's screens from studies from Microsoft. And the other thing is, uh, is it, is it this enough? Uh, is it true that we can just uh, throw away desks and throw away all furniture? Or there is still a piece of furniture that maybe can help uh, reinvent the office and the workspace of the future? Well, in fact, um, we need a furniture, but uh, while we were thinking of the furniture, we were inspired by this great master Italian designer of the last century, Bruno Munari, 
Uh, here we see his study seeking for the comfort on an uncomfortable chair. So, so far we knew that the ergonomy, the best ergonomy was sit perfectly in uh, one chair, but um, actually we can achieve our comfort sitting all in different positions, as he was doing here. So this is our work, what, how we did uh, envision for the uh, spaces of work. So we did imagine to stage the workstations, the work areas. For that, we begin to design, um, let's say, furniture, uh, beginning from the cut of the cubes in different shapes and in different sizes, where that, that, that would help the people to sit in or to, to find their comfort in different way. And this is our office. For this office, we will need uh, an open space. And this is our wall of uh, office. In an office, you can choose what you would like to do. It is not always the same. You can choose if you would like to do a meeting, if you would like to do an international meeting with uh, communicating with others, other countries. We can choose to do a very small meeting. We can do lectures. We can do several different things. So why we have to be obliged to have a restricted way of sitting and working? In this case, you can get from your wall the pieces that you would need to compose your office space, to compose your workspace. Actually, there is no more office. So uh, we have our infinite way of sitting um, uh, on, on sofas, or we have our uh, chaise longs, or we have the uh, amphitheater way of sitting. And we do add the carpets, the carpets that actually, as in the Turkish culture, will define the space. And in this case, we'll define also our space where we would like to work. And also, it may combine the furniture and also the people together. And we, did put, uh, we do put the screens, as Mark was explaining before, it, that can be uh, rotate. Um, it, it can be used in several different ways and several different sizes. And we do put the people. So that's our proposal, our vision, part at least of our vision for the work in the future. As Daphne was saying, we don't need necessarily an office. Uh, we just uh, need uh, a, an open space. It could be, could be an empty building, it could be a loft, it could be a home. And, and we definitely don't need uh, any of the cubicles we have today. We don't need desks. Uh, we don't need uh, to ask people to work uh, straight uh, and 90 degrees. We don't need a grid. Uh, the flexibility and the organic spaces that are created are created by people deciding how to collaborate, uh, how to sit down, and uh, by uh, using screens uh, to define these spaces even better. So that's uh, a little less uh, related uh, strictly to the relationship between natural and artificial, but actually it is, uh, because uh, there is uh, an aspect of uh, natural uh, gestures, natural behaviors uh, that we have uh, uh, as people uh, that has been restricted uh, and depressed uh, by uh, forcing us to live into grids of cubicles uh, and gray spaces. So that's what we have. Uh, we hope that the two projects explained a little bit of what we think and what we dream about the future. Uh, we hope that this has explained uh, how we, th we hope that uh, artificial will not kill nature but will evolve, help nature evolve faster. And we, we are very happy about our flying man there. We were actually very careful to adjust the angle of the man because we wanted him to fly. Then somebody told us, uh, are you sure maybe this guy is actually falling down a hill <laughs> in an abyss? Well, we are optimistic. We think always that the glass is half full, uh, and we believe that there is 
a, an opportunity to rethink to a new idea of progress. Uh, we hope that, that you agree with us on this. Thank you. Thank you. Great stuff, thank you. Amazing. Thank you for sharing your vision on food and vision on how office will, will change. Uh, I have uh, too many questions, <laughs> but the first I think most people would be very curious about. Uh, do you have kids? One. <laughs> One. <laughs> Where is? Hello. <laughs> and second question is, how do you work together as a couple? Uh, very well, very well. <laughs> no, it is perfect. Actually, um, when we receive the commitment from our clients, it, it is the, 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 the first phase is fantastic because we do immediately tell and express what we are feeling and then we separate. And individually we work on this Go your own subject. ways. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In a way, and then we reunite and we share our final opinions and then we find where is the best point so we combine ours actually i was asking not in terms of process but oh, in see. terms of being as a, <laughs> a couple and how, how it so works far, out so good. is it something <laughs> difficult or is it flowing naturally it's in your relationship it's flowing as much as combining natural and artificial. We don't, we don't tell who's natural and who's artificial. <laughs> it's possible and it's nice and it's okay. fun. Okay, one last, less difficult question for you. Uh, would it be possible for Turkish kebab to be adapted to the molecular cuisine? Well, um, I think there are some studies right now that uh, some people are working on it. Yeah. And I don't know if it's going to be real molecular or not, but it is going to be adapted in a different stage. This is what, what, what I heard. What I suggest as an aesthetic language is to keep the grease dripping, because <laughs> that's very much part of the ritual of, of eating kebab. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.